Welcome back, folks, to Swift on Sundays. I'm Paul Hudson. Uh, this is actually episode 17 of this series, which means we have now built uh, 16 complete apps from scratch, uh, which I think is remarkable, personally. Um, they're all on YouTube. All can go and watch a replay later on if you want to. There's a big uh, Swift on Sundays playlist you can go through if you want to see all of them in order. Um, this time, though, we're going to be building a game again, um, but a little bit different to the previous games. You know, we've done Sprite Kit twice now, uh, and that's fun. I, I like Sprite Kit a lot. This time, though, we're going to be using UI Kit and Core Graphics to do our drawing. Um, and it's still within the same sort of plan for these streams. If it's your first time, you know, the goal of the Sunday streams is to make an app in about an hour from scratch. Um, often we go, you know, 75 minutes, or even 90 minutes, but an hour is my, my actual goal. Um, so we can actually do something pretty useful, I think, with UI Kit and core graphics in that time, as you will see. Um, and I think you'll be impressed how fast we can kind of put things together in this game as well, because it's lots of fun to make, and uh, it's it's a real game too, which is cool. Uh, and what we're going to do is we're going to build a game with uh, various uh, dots around the screen. And between those dots will be lines connecting like a, a mesh, like a, um, a mesh and a ball of wool all messed up. And it's the player's job to move those dots around to untangle the lines. And when they do so, it'll level up and become harder with more dots and more dots and more dots. And that's how the game works. You've got to try and untangle the things as fast and efficiently as possible. Uh, that's the plan. Now, uh, as always, I have a handful of rules, um, one of which is I have a zero tolerance for harassment or abuse of any kind. I have moderators uh, hanging around who will boot you for life um, for any sort of harassment or abuse. It's just, that's how it works. We haven't got any patience for that at all. If you have questions about what I'm doing while I'm doing it, then please go ahead and ask in the chat window. I am watching it as much as I can and answering questions as I go from there. If your questions are everything else, like what do I think is going to happen at dub dub 19 or what's my view on Flutter, or where do babies come from, everything else ever, ask that at the end of the stream in about an hour, an hour and a quarter's time. Um, otherwise, it just continues to give me this speed bump. It makes it awfully hard to work. So if you could, ask on-topic questions as I go, ask off-topic questions at the end. Uh, and before I start, I have three small announcements just to run them by you to remind you of this. Uh, if you are in San Jose... For Dub Dub DC Week, you want to come along to Swift Over Coffee Live, a live podcast recording I'm doing with my friend Sean Allen. Uh, it's free of charge to get into it, but you have to, you have to get a ticket, otherwise we can't know how many folks are coming. Uh, so if you want to come to that, please do. I'll paste the chat uh, log there. That's the link uh, to Tito for AltConf. Um, you haven't got to have an AltConf ticket to come to the event. You just get that one ticket for that one podcast thing. Come and say hello. That'd be awesome. It'd be a lot of fun. We already had, I think, 310 folks sign up, so um, get your ticket while you still can. Uh, secondly, I am running a live conference here in the UK in July, July 8th and 9th, uh, with proceeds going to charity. If you want to come along to that, please do. It's called Hacking Your Swift Live. I'll put a link for that to the chat window again. Uh, it's easy enough. It is hackingyourswift.com slash live. Uh, and finally, you can go and check out my new app for learning iOS. It's called Unwrap. It's free on the App Store with no in-app purchases. Uh, and it's got stacks of videos and tests and activities built in. Go check it out, and I'll paste that into the chat window as well. That is hackingwithswift.com slash unwrap. And that's it for adverts. That's it for rules. Let's go ahead and start coding our project. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen like that. There we go. Uh, let's make this chat window fractionally bigger so you can see it like that. Ah, Ravi Sharma, I'm glad you're enjoying it. Please do leave a review in the App Store. We've had a lot of five-star reviews. And I'm very grateful for them all, um, but having more is always a good thing. So please leave a review in the App Store. Same for you, John. I'm glad you're enjoying it. Anyway, uh, let's go ahead and dive into our project. So here I'm in Xcode 10.2.1 with 5, of course. Um, the first thing I'm going to do is create a new single-view app. So I'll press uh, Command-Shift-N, make a new app. Uh, and then I'll choose, let's move this up to the side like that. Make it fractionally bigger. I'm going to choose an iOS single view app and press next. I'll call this thing Untangler. That's the name of our little game. And press next and create on my desktop. Like that. Yeah, Ravi, so I'm not going to do more UI view stuff in there because it's not an app for teaching iOS. It's an app for teaching Swift. It could work on tvOS or watchOS or macOS, not just iOS. So there's never going to be any iOS-specific stuff in there, sadly. Maybe later on. 
Anyway, here's our single view app here. Um, the first thing we're gonna do is scatter around these connection dots for folks to tap on and drag around to rearrange their lines. Now, how many we actually want depends on what level they are. So as we increase in level, we'll add more and more and more dots to make the game harder and harder. So the first thing I'll do is go to viewcontrol.swift and uh, add a property that will store their current level so we know how many dots to create. So I'll say var current level is zero. That's our starting level. Uh, the second thing I'll do is add a property to store all the connections we create, all those little UI views they can drag around so we can reference them later on more easily. So I'll say var connections is an array of UI view like that. Steve, thank you very much. I do give all my super chats to my dog in dog treats. When they come in, I'll make sure they get the first dog treat from you, Steve. Thank you very much. Anyway, uh, this is our array of all the connection dots around our screens. So we can start drawing them. And now we'll write our first important bit of method. It's called level up. Oops, level up. And this will be called whenever we want to create a new level, harder and harder and harder. So the first thing we'll do is say add one to current level like that. So we're on level zero, now we're on level one, the first level, then level two, three, four, five, six, and seven, and so forth. Uh, then we're gonna go ahead and clean out any views we have already. Ah, or if the first dog's already arrived, uh, come on you, you've got a treat from Steve Bills. Who wants it? You know you want it? Okay, come on. Good girl. This is Luna. Good girl. Only one so far. Ari, you come back later, okay? You come back later, you'll get a treat. Don't look so desperate. You get treats all the time. You can get fat on these days, dog. Anyway, add one to the current level and then clear out any of these connection views we have already. Before we make any more one, more fresh ones, just clear out the ones we have already. So I'll say uh, connections dot for each. Then inside there, do dollar zero dot remove from super view. Destroy all the connection views we created previously. So whenever we call level up, we get a fresh screen with fresh connections every single time. Oops. It's dropping some frames on my connection. I wonder why. That's a bad sign. Huh, anyway, it seems to be temporary. Yep, it's temporary, who knows. Anyway, um, go ahead and restore all our connections. Then I'll say uh, connections array, oops, connections dot remove all. Just zap them all from the array. We're gonna create wholly new ones here from scratch as we go. Uh, Bibin, could it be private? Yeah, sure. There's only one view controller here. <laughs> um, so if you wanna get private, yeah, fine, make it private. It's gonna make no difference whatsoever. Um, so that'll tell us, uh, go ahead and zap everything from our screen. And now we can go ahead and create new uh, view controllers, uh, new, sorry, draggable views on our screen. We can move around. So I'll say for underscore in one, through, and I'm gonna use our current level plus four. So we'll start on level zero, we'll add one immediately on level one, and this will create one through five, so five of these things, five draggable areas every time, for level one, and then two and three. Question from Varanchi, why is remove from CPU required? Because we'll be calling level up every time we want to get harder and harder and harder. So we wanna remove the previous level's dots, connection areas, before we make new ones. So in this, slide, this loop here, we'll make new connection dots now, uh, and we wanna make sure we remove any previous levels, otherwise I'll just get more and more and more dots, which will be confusing for everybody. We don't want that. So, zap them all, and then make a new connection dot. We'll say let connection equals a UI view with the frame CG rect. Origin is zero, so top left corner, and size will be a CG size, with the width 44, height 44. Now, if you weren't familiar with this, uh, Apple recommend that 44 is the minimum smallest touchable size you should make your things. Um, and I think it's more than that. It's touchable, of course, but harder to touch for sort of fat fingers like mine, for example. Keep in mind, uh, iPad mini scales down the screen, so 44 ends up being like 32 or so, and that becomes really, really small. So if you go lower than 44, you might find your things untappable. It's a bad idea. Anyway, uh, that's our connection dot. I'm gonna say you have uh, a background color of white, so you're nice and visible. Uh, your layer has a corner radius of 22, i.e. half of 44. So rather than being a square box, it'll be a nice round circle. Uh, 
then I'll say connection.layer.borderwidth is two. Now by default, these things have a border color of black. So we're saying draw a two point black line around these circles. One point of which will be inside the circle, one point will be outside the circle. Then connections.append connection. Add that to our arrays, we can reference it later on. And view.add subview that connection. So it's on the screen. So if I press Command R now, actually no, better call level up somewhere. <laughs> so I'll call level up here and view did load. Uh, if I press Command R now, we should see something vaguely working on the screen. This is in the iPhone XR simulator, which is fine. It's nice and big. Let's launch that up. Da -da. Question from Goosewag Walker: Why the plus four on the loop? Um, because otherwise there'd be only one point in the first level. Um, because that'd be like the, the drag, be no lines whatsoever. We want to say at least five. So current levels one plus four, making five, create five of these things. Next time level two, create six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and so forth. Uh, question for Bibin, how to put a border line with a bit of a gap from the view frame? You can't, I'm afraid. There is exactly one border and it goes exactly around the view frame. Anyway, in our layout now you can see that is our view there. There are five of them. It looks like one of them because they're all stacked vertically at zero, zero in the top left corner. Um, so it doesn't look great right now, but at least works, right? This is vaguely working. Um, to make things slightly more visible for you, I'm going to change my background color. If we do view dot background color is dot dark gray. Uh, that way you'll see the white of the circles and the black line around them a bit more clearly. There we go. There's our, our, our circle at the top there, looking quite nice. So it's not positioned anywhere right now. That's why it's all appearing in the top left corner. It isn't ideal. What we want to do is move them around the screen randomly. So I'll make a new method inside my view controller called func place some sort of connection which is a UI view. And all this is gonna do is make two random numbers, uh, one for X and one for Y. I'm gonna indent this from the edges of our view by a certain amount, so it's more visible. I can hear my dogs barking downstairs because they're playing clearly quite loudly. So I close my door. There we go. One dog was quiet, two dogs, very noisy it turns out, who knew? So there's gonna be two random positions, one random X and one random Y. I'll say uh, in here, in place, let random x is a CG float, dot random in some sort of range. Now in this, I'm gonna say actually, it's gonna be a minimum of 20 on the x, up to view dot bounds dot max x minus 20. So go from the left edge to the right edge, position it like that, and that's more or less fine. You can do more accurate if you wanted to, but that's basically fine. I have a random y, We'll do the same sort of thing, but make it slightly more indented. So we'll do random in 50 up to, um, through, sorry, bounds up max y minus 50. So a bit more padding on the top and bottom edges like that. And that's where we want to place each of our views, that particular view in question. So I'll say this connection, this UI view, dot center is a CG point, x random x, y random y, like that. So that'll position one of our connection views randomly on the screen. So they're not all in the top left corner, they're somewhere else on the screen. Of course, we want to place all of our connections and helpfully, we have this array called connections. So we can go ahead and at the end of level up, we can say connections dot for each place, like that. And that'll call place, our place method, once for each of our connections. So it'll place it randomly on the screen. I'll press Command R now, and hopefully all of our views should now be scattered across the screen quite neatly. Let us find out. There we go. So it's got this nice sort of bow shape here going on. I'll run it again, and it should be different every time, hopefully. There we go. Bit of overlap here, but that's fine. Bibin, no, there'll be no screen rotations here whatsoever. You can't really do it because they're placed somewhere on the screen. Realistically, you want to choose one device or one orientation and just stick with that because otherwise, when you rotate, where would they move to? Because it could be off screen now, it'd be weird. Um, anyway, 
do it one last time, which is another third layout. Boom. Okay. So those are our things looking nicely. Uh, what we want to do, of course, is have the player tap on these things and drag them around so they can rearrange them to fit so the lines don't overlap anymore. Now, there are a number of ways of making uh, dragging work. I'm going to go for the easiest approach here. It's not the laziest approach, but I think it's the easiest to understand, the easiest to work with, so the easiest to scale. And that is to replace our UI view with a custom UI view subclass, where we have dedicated code encapsulated in this class to handle dragging around. And more importantly, telling our parent view controller when something's happened, when a drag's happened or a drag's finished. So back in Xcode, I'll press Command N, make a new Coco Touch class, subclassing UI view, and I'll call this thing connection view. This will be one connection on our screen, one of those circle dots on our screen. So I'll press next and create. And then scrap this code in there, like that. So this is going to have three properties. One is going to be a closure that will be called when the thing has moved slightly. So whenever we move that dot around, we'll call this closure. In, in our code, that will tell the view controller to redraw its lines. There'd be another closure saying the dragging's finished. So I've let go of my finger, do something else. And yes, that might redraw the lines, but more importantly, when they've released their finger, we should check whether they've successfully un untangled all the lines. So if they have, they've won that level. And the third property is going to be uh, where they started touching the view. And the reason for this is because in a 44 point wide view, if you have fairly other you know, skinny fingers and so forth, you can be quite accurate in where you press inside that 44 points. So what you want to happen is when you press down on the left edge, you want to drag from the left edge. You don't want to snap that thing to the center of your finger. That would look weird and, and wrong. You'd get unintentional moves, which is a bad idea. So we'll pin it to where they start tapping it and offset from there so it looks much more smooth. Can I point to other examples of way of doing dragging? Yeah, you can do the whole thing without UI views at all. You can just do a, use a regular UI view with no subclass and do it all from the view control if you wanted to. Uh, that also works fine. Um, you can use transforms. You can use CGI fine transforms. We aren't using them here, but you can do that. Uh, I said there are other options, and that's fine. But I think you'll find this one quite easy. Anyway, those are our properties. So let's start with those. We'll say uh, var uh, drag changed drag changed, is a closure that accepts no parameters and returns void, optional. So it might be there, might not be there, but it will be there. And there, var drag finished, another closure, takes no param, returns void, again, optional. We'll call those two when things happen. And finally, var touch start position is cg.0. And that's going to store where inside this touch handle they, they, they start dragging from, so we know where to keep it attached to as they move around. All right, inside here, we're gonna implement methods for touches began, touches moved, touches ended, and touches canceled. And as far as we're concerned, canceled and ended is the same thing. At the system level, fine, they're different. You know, a canceled touch is one where, say a phone call came in while they're using their app, it's not really, they haven't left the finger necessarily, something else happened that interrupted them. Um, we don't care, it's only a game, so we'll just call ended from cancelled. So we'll start with touches began. And this thing, um, it will start nice and easily, we'll, we'll figure out where they touched. So we'll say guard let uh, touch equals touches.first else return. So read the first touch from a set that came in. They should always be there, but as long as I'm being safe. We'll then say uh, let start pause equals touch dot location in self. So we're finding out where inside our view did they start tapping. It's only 44 points wide and 44 points high, but it's still enough that we care inside that where it's going to be. And what we're going to do is stash that away in our uh, our uh, proper property that's here, touch start position. We'll put it in there straight away. We'll say touch start pause equals start pause. But I don't even need start pause. You can probably just do that directly. Yeah, like that. Boom. Let's put it straight into our property like that. So we know where they started tapping before dragging happened. Next, 
what we're going to do, importantly, is offset this thing by half our width and height. Now you gotta keep in mind, UI kit measures from the top left corner of stuff. We're gonna be dragging around our center point of our circle, not a top left corner. We position from the center when we do the, the property in iOS. And so we wanna find that center and offset that to our top touch start position. So we'll say touch start pause dot x minus equals our frame dot size dot height divided by two. Right, frame dot height, sorry. And then touch start pause dot y minus equals frame, oh, not height, that should be width. Silly me. Frame dot width. Even though it's exactly square, it's still worth doing. Frame dot height divided by two. So remember, we're gonna say the center of this view is moving around, but because iOS measures from the top left, we have to take into account that center, otherwise it'll be offset by half the view size every time, it's a bad idea. So we now know where they started touching this view. The last thing we're gonna do is twofold. First, we'll modify our transform. So we are a CG affine transform with scale X 1.15 and Y 1.15 will make this view 15% bigger than normal. So it's obvious it's being dragged around. It'll be bigger, and when we release, we'll shrink it down again. So you can see what they're moving around right now really clearly on the screen. We're also gonna say to our super view, question mark, bring sub view to front, us. Bring our circle above all the other circles. Otherwise, it might go below another circle, which would look weird on the screen. Bring this thing to the front. So that is all of touches began. Touches moved, start similarly, we'll say guard let touch is touches.first else return. But then we want to figure out where we tapped, we'll say let point equals touch.location in our super view. Where did they drag to on the screen? If they drag to, you know, zero, zero, that's our new position. So we'll say our new center position is equal to a CG point of their X position where they dragged us to minus touch start pause dot X. And our Y is point dot Y minus touch start pause dot Y, like that. And this is why touch start pause is important because we know from this thing, they're tapped somewhere inside that circle. And when they drag to zero, zero, their center shouldn't be zero, zero, because they, they may have dragged from the left edge of our view, view. That left edge should be zero, zero. So this is why we have to take store touch start pause immediately and offset that point from our center every time we drag around. After doing that, we'll call our drag changed closure. We've moved around somehow. We don't care what that means, just that it exists. So we'll call that now. Four touches ended. I'll scroll down slightly. All this has to do is put back our transform to be dot identity. So remove that scale transform we applied so we're back to our 100% of our size. And then we'll say drag finished. So tell whoever made us, or whatever they, they want to do with it, that our dragon is now finished. They've released their finger, what do you want to do? And finally, touch is cancelled when they, uh, you know, they, the phone call came in or alert appeared or whatever, maybe an important push appeared, who knows what. Um, this happens, we'll just call touch has ended directly. Passing our touches and the same event. We don't really care what happens there. It's not likely, but it's worth taking care of it. So now we have a custom UI view subclass that knows how to drag itself around. Our parent view controller hasn't got to care these things are draggable. However, we have to create and use them, right? In our view controller Swift file, you can see we have UI view here, UI view here, and UI view here. Each of those three things should now be connection view. So I'll say this is an array of connection view. This is a new connection view and this takes a connection view parameter like that. So they're being used absolutely everywhere in our thing. I'll press Command R and hopefully it's starting to come together. 
There's our circles again. I will grab this one. You'll see it scale up. I can now move it around and release it. It scales down again. Cool. So this is kind of working. I mean, the game's sort of vaguely coming together, right? <laughs> uh, obviously, there's more work to do, but that's okay. Now for the important part. You know, we want to have lines connecting these things together so you can see the tangled up mess you have to untangle as part of the game. Uh, now, we already know the endpoints of our uh, lines because that's these things here. You know, this is an endpoint here, endpoint, 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 endpoint. But what we don't know is what it's connecting to. We don't know where the line goes to. We know one starts here, but does that connect to this one, this one, this one, or this one? We don't currently know. So the first thing we're going to do is add a new property to our connection view class here that stores what comes after it. What comes next? What is it connected to? So over in connection view at Swift, I'm going to say var after is another connection view implicitly unwrapped. Um, we know it's got to exist, it will always exist, um, but it'll start off with being nil when it's first made. So we've got that thing there. Now, the next step is to, once we've made all our connection views, loop through them all and set that after property so every view knows what it connected to in the first place. So if you can draw it Swift, we have code here for looping over and making all our connection views. Once that's finished, I'll loop over again. I'll say, for i in zero up to connections dot count if i is connections dot count minus one if this is the last item then this thing will connect to the first thing so the last item goes back to the first one so there's a full uh, view here full circle so I'll say connections i dot after equals connections zero. Go back to the beginning again. For every other one, we can say connections i dot after equals connections i plus one. Go to the next item in this. Uh, Pablo, yes, this is a linked list. Exactly right. It ends up being a linked list ultimately. So it goes to the next one. So we now know the last one goes back to the first one again and every other one goes to the next one in its line. So they are now connected, right? You can't see that. Of course, there are no lines on the screen yet, but they are now connected. Now comes the core graphics part. What we want to do is render a series of lines between all our dots behind those dots so you can see exactly what's connected to everything else. I'm going to do that with a uh, image view. So up in my view controller at Swift, I'll add a new property here. I'll say let... Uh, rendered lines equals Bibin, I'm going to come to that, chill out. Uh, the rendered lines equals a new UI image view, like that. And that's going to fill the screen, right? That's the whole thing. The whole screen is that image view, basically. So in view to load, I'm going to say uh, rendered lines dot tamic equals false. Uh, that is translates auto resizing masks into constraints. Just type TAMIC and a code bitch will do it for you. It's much easier. Uh, then we'll say view.add sub view that rendered lines image view. So it's on the screen now. For its constraints, these are trivial, just fill the screen. So I'll do ns layout constraint dot activate an array of, and this will basically be the whole screen. So I'll just do rendered lines dot top anchor dot constraint equal to view dot top anchor no safe area here just fill the screen uh, then I'll just paste that a few times like that so we've got top anchor we'll need uh, bottom anchor we'll need leading anchor and we'll need trailing anchor uh, so you're trailing you're trailing you are leading and you are bottom, like that. So that'll pin our image view so it fills the whole screen. Now, of course, we want to draw our lines. It's actually fairly easy to do because we know exactly where our connection points are, but now I'm just looping over those and saying, draw a line from me to my connection. So I'll make some space below this place method. And I'll say, func, redraw lines. 
Uh, this is gonna use my favorite class for this, which is UI graphics image renderer. Uh, this just draws things very efficiently. Uh, for the bounds, I'm gonna say, just use our view bounds, just fill the whole screen. And then our rendered lines image dot image equals renderer dot image with a context coming in. Uh, so all we have to do now is say, go over all our connections array and draw a line from our center, oops, CTX in, from our center to our connection center. So I'll say for connection in connections, UI color dot green dot set, nice big bright green line, CTX dot CG context dot stroke line segments. It takes in a between array of CG points, which is great for us. We can do an array of connection dot after dot center, oh, after dot center and connection dot center. So that's our entire line right there. And that's it. That's all it takes to draw our lines, right? It's not too hard to do. Uh, of course, we want to do that as we drag things around. Now, if you remember in our connection view, in touches move, we're calling this drag changed closure. That's not set yet, of course. That's what we're going to do now. We're going to say in our view controller, as we create our connection views here, we're going to set drag changed to call ourselves and say redraw lines. So I'll say uh, connection dot drag changed equals a closure with weak self in to avoid retain cycles. Then call self dot redraw lines. But actually, what is the CG context? It is a core graphics drawing context where you can do fills, shapes, squares, lines, gradients, you name it, shadows, it's all done through a CG context like that. So we're saying to our uh, connection view type now, whenever you are dragged anywhere, call redraw lines immediately. And in theory, if I don't screw anything up, if I go ahead and uh, press Command R, it run it again, we should see some action. Let's find out. So there are no lines here, that's okay. But as soon as I grab one and move it around, boom, you see our lines appear straight away. And you can now get a sense for how our game's going to work. It'll start off quite tangled and messed up, and they'll be asked to drag these things around to make it less messed up, like that. Okay, not bad. Uh, so there, there are some problems here. Oh, you want line width? I can do line width. I mean, you make it's your game, make as lines quick as thick as you want, Mongo. I guess you're asking why doesn't it appear originally? Um, it doesn't appear originally because, uh, Michael, scroll down. Okay, there you go. It doesn't appear originally because we don't call redraw lines until we've moved our first connection view. Uh, what we want to do, of course, is to move uh, to redraw lines immediately. Uh, and the fix for that is to, hopefully Michael's seen the code by now, get a screenshot otherwise, Michael, this is your chance. Three, two, one. Uh, the fix for that is, of course, to call redraw lines immediately. Uh, so below this call to place, I'll say redraw lines. So as soon as uh, the levels finish rendering everything, go ahead and call redraw lines immediately. I'll press Command R again. We should now see lines immediately as the level loads. Boom, look at that. Lots of messy lines have to drag around. Yeah, not going to happen. Ooh, fast moderators, I love it. Good job, Kristaps. Now, here's an interesting problem. As someone did uh, ask earlier, Bibi asked, as I said, Bibi asked, sorry, uh, why don't you start completely untangled? We're going to fix that. Um, and the other thing we're going to fix, and this is much more important, is the fact that it's not immediately obvious when a line is tangled. Now, fair enough, lines, uh, there's only a few lines so far, but as our levels advance, it'll get harder and harder and harder. It'll be more messy. We'll be quite sure if the line's safe or not. What we want to do really is say, actually, when that happens, when these lines are crossed over something else, we want to uh, make those lines red. So it's much more apparent when it's a crossing area. Uh, now, we're going to fix that. We totally are. But first, I'm going to pause and ask you if you are enjoying this video, if you are liking what you're seeing here, if you like it on Sundays, please go ahead and like this video. Leave a like. Uh, it means a lot to me. Helps YouTube recommend it to other users, which means more folks watch your videos, which means I am more encouraged to make more Sunday streams. So you like it. Helps me. Helps you. Helps everybody. Like the video. Subscribe to their channel. It's a great channel. Full of great stuff like this. Anyway, thank you, Pablo. It's very kind of you.
So, what we want to do is calculate uh, when uh, when uh, we have lines crossing. Uh, now, this is actually quite hard to do. Um, so, I have totally pinched this from two very good books, as I'll show you in a second. Um, this is actually surprisingly hard to do efficiently. Um, so, what we're going to do is we're going to go to a great resource I can highly recommend called the Swift Knowledge Base, made by me. It's got 600 and something answers and questions and uh, solutions and so forth for Swift or a bit for a Swift 5. Um, so, helpfully, I have added some code here that solves a problem beautifully. If you're on there, it is hackingyourself.com slash example dash code. You want to look for uh, line intersect. should find it. Or lines intersect. I'll probably find it. There we go. How to calculate the point where two lines intersect. Go in there. There's some code here. And this is where I have basically adapted it from. Uh, this amazing article by Ronald Goodman in the book Graphics Gems. Um, and there's no code in there. It's not a code book, that particular part. Uh, it's just a load of algebra. I have ported that algebra to Swift for you um, to make your life easier. And if you really want to know, use the cross product and coefficients to figure out exactly where two lines cross in a very, very fast way. Um, now, in our case, we don't really care where the lines cross, just that they do cross. But it's still fine. We can use this thing here. So what I want to do is go to this URL, uh, which is uh, go to example code and search for lines intersect. And you'll find this thing. And just snag that entire method. Take the whole thing and paste it into your code. And if you want to know more about how it works, I can highly recommend it. I've even brought the thing out for you. Um, either that article in that book, Graphics Gems, or for real knowledge about how cross products work and how dot products work, this book here is amazing. Uh, Essential Mathematics for Games and Internet Applications. I linked to it, I mentioned it again in the article at the bottom here. Grab that book. It, I use it all the time for complicated stuff like this. It's really, really good. Check that out. Anyway, we're not going to recreate uh, Goodman's algorithm here. We're just going to use it. So you want to snag that method, this lines cross method here, and paste that into our project. So in Xcode, I'm going to paste it in, boom, like that. Now you'll see this thing uh, takes a number of parameters. Um, start one, end one, start two, and then two. And that's because Core Graphics has not got a lines primitive in there. Stefan can't download Sourceful. That's a, that's a you problem, not a me problem. CocoaPods works just fine in France. That's how I checked. Uh, anyway, um, there's no CG line. So we've got to pass in four CG points. The start of our first line, the end of our first line, start of the second line, end of the second line, like that. And from that, it'll tell you exactly where in global space those two lines overlap. Uh, now, all we care about is do they overlap or not. And you'll see it returns an optional tuple. And that'll be nil if lines do not overlap which in our case is what we care about. So, 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 so. What we're going to do now is call lines cross inside our redraw lines method. So as we're drawing our lines, we'll say UI green color set if it does not overlap anything else. Otherwise, UI uh, color red set when it does overlap something else. So I'll replace this call here, UI color green set, with this code. First, var is line clear is true. Assume this line is clear of other lines, but kind of green by default. And now we're going to say for other in connections. So we have an inner loop. We're going to go over every connection and inside that, go over every connection again. An, in, an nested loop here. We're going to say if the lines cross. Hello, Aria. I'm sorry, there's no super chats yet, sweetheart. I'm sorry. You can come back later, okay? Maybe you get some more treats later on. Go on, clear off. Go on, off you go. Clear off. Don't come in. There's no point you both come in. Clear off. Uh, if the lines cross. And for our start point, that will be our connection center. Where we get to right now. And our first end point will be our connections after dot center. So it, what it connects to, like that. For start two, that will be uh, the other thing. Our nested loop will say other dot center. And for n2, what it connects to, which will be other dot after dot center. So it definitely works with GitHub and, and CocoaPobs just fine. Uh, anyway. David Lindsay, with the after var in connection view, 
Does not that var end of the connection be called after two? Yes, it does. There's a it's a loop of stuff. Uh, that's why it has to be a class. Well, also because it inherits from UI view for a start. Um, we couldn't do that with a stripe because it'd be infinitely sized, which you can do with a class just fine. Anyway, um, so this will this will uh, check whether the line from our our current connection to its connection and the other connection to its connection overlap. In this case, it would do because they sort of overlap and it's X in the middle. Uh, if it does, we'll get back a tuple with some value. So I'll say if that is not equal to nil, then line uh, uh, is line clear is false. This is a bad color bailout. And then break. Stop doing the nested loop. At this point, we're going to say if is line clear, UI color dot green dot set. This line is good. It doesn't cost anything. Else, UI color dot red dot set. At least one thing overlaps this line. And now, hopefully, if I press Command R, they should start to come together. Boom. As I drag around, it'll go red like that. Uh, drag it around here, that's red, across the board, completely freely. So now it's really clear where the problems in your level lie. As you can see at a glance, good or not good. And it is lightning fast. I've tested it on an old iPad Air 2 and it was absolutely fine. Like I said, you could, if it, if it happened to be slow for you, if you had like lots and lots of connections, um, you could just ditch this last part where it calculates the intersection. That eliminates two multiplies and two adds. You just want true or false, you know? <laughs> you just want uh, that extra bit of speed, but you know, it's, it's, it's basically fine here. Anyway, so now we know whether we have lines crossing or not, we can go back to Bibbin's question. You know, we can change the way the game's created because right now it's possible, if I try it a few times, it's possible to create a level where there are no overlaps. Like this one here, that's probably, yeah, there's no overlaps here at all. That line's just fine. That doesn't go over it. So there's no overlaps here. This is a rubbish level. This is not a fun level. What we want to do is make a new method that says, just go over all the lines and return true if it's all good or false otherwise. So I'm going to scroll down and say, func level clear returns bool. And then for connection in connections, go over all the dots in our game. Then again, inside that, for other in connections, go over all the inner connections as well. If we get our lines crossing from again, it was connection dot uh, center, end one was connection dot after dot center, start two was other dot center, and end two was other dot after dot center, like that is not nil, then return false immediately, the level's not clear, otherwise at the end of those loops return true. The level is completely clear. And with that, we can now, when we're making our level, we call a level up, we can say, try and place all the dots, is the level clear? Yes. Try again, place all the dots, is the level clear? Yes, again and again and again, until the level's completely clear. Now, you know, the chance of it being created once is pretty low, but of course exists, twice or three times is really, really low. So this loop won't have to run that many times. So inside uh, level up, uh, up here, here we go. We have connections for each place. I'll replace that with a repeat call. Keep on calling connections for each place while level clear. So I'll call it at least once, place them initially. And if this returns true saying the level's clear, it'll call it again and again and again and again and again and again and again until finally the level's not clear, which would be pretty quickly and at which point there's at least one crossing point in our level. That should be fine. Even better, now we have this method level clear, we now know immediately, is this level finished? Have they successfully unscrambled the level? So if they have, that means they've finished the level. We can go on to the next level. So we'll, what we'll do is we'll say, add a new method down here, func check move. And we're gonna call this thing when they've released one of the dragging parts of our views. When they've released their finger, they've made their move, has that now finished the level? We'll say, if the level is clear, awesome. They're done. Don't let it move anymore, the level's finished, it's all green, we're happy. 
To stop that, we'll say view dot is user interaction enabled equals false. Stop any more dragging now. Then we'll say UI view dot animate with duration and delay. That one, I think. Duration 0.5, so half a second. Delay one second. Let them admire the beautiful thing they've made by unwrapping all the lines. Options, there'll be none. We don't care about those things. Animations, there's to be a closure of stuff. One brace, thank you very much, Xcode. A closure of stuff. Uh, like, come on, space it in, please. There we go. Uh, we're going to say inside there, we're going to animate self.rendered lines.alpha is zero. Fade out the lines they've untangled over half a second. And also, for connection in self.connections, connection.alpha is zero. Ah, come on, alpha is zero. Fade out all the dots as well. So we'll get rid of the lines and the dots after a second's delay. When that completes, we'll add a completion closure. We'll say, did this uh, finish or not? And inside here, when they've actually finished the animation, we'll say self.view dot is user enabled equals true, re-enable touches, self.rendered lines dot alpha is one, show the lines again, and call level up again to re-remove all the dots and create new ones and call redraw lines again. So the level will get harder when they're finished after the animation completes. Down here, if this else happens, it means they are still playing this level. So we'll just carry on going through with stuff. Now, of course, we want the trigger check move when they've released their finger. When they've made a move, we want to say, did that finish the level or not? So uh, we have a closure for that already. Here we have drag changed being set. We'll add to that connection dot drag finished. Same thing, weak self in, self question mark dot check move. So when they've released the finger, every time check whether they've won the game or not. I'll press command R now, and hopefully we should get somewhere. Maybe now it's putting spaces because pressing tab was activating the autocomplete system, which was not helpful. No one ever pressed tab. Anyway, so here it's totally crossed. Awesome. I'll drag that out and drag this one to there. It fades away. New lines pop in, and now there are six lines to solve. Uh, I'll drag that one to here, and this one to here, and this one to uh, there. Good. Now there are seven lines to solve. As we progress, the game just gets harder and harder. Now there's even more, so uh, there we go. Okay, so this game is really coming together quite nicely. Of course, what you really want in a game is proof of your awesomeness. Um, you want to show for a fact how great you are at playing the game, and that means having a score. So back in Xcode, I'm going to say there is uh, let score label is a UI label. Like that. And var score is zero. So by default, they have no score. We'll add a property observer to this. Uh, SV, yes, the videos on YouTube afterwards, uh, the replay, and there'll be a code on GitHub as well. And here we'll say did set. When a score value changes, we'll update our score by saying score label dot text equals score string tabulation our score. As we add to the score, it'll just change the label automatically. Uh, then we want to, of course, configure that inside view to load. So we'll say score is zero by default. Now, of course, that repeats what we have up here, but that's okay because it'll trigger our property observer. It'll set the text to be score zero, which is nice. We'll say uh, this has a text color of dot cyan, nice and bright on the background. White would overlap the circles a bit badly, so I won't use white here. I think cyan works better. Uh, for its font, we're going to say it's a UI font with the bold system font of size 24, so nice chunky font. Uh, score label dot tamic is false, and viewed or add sub view the score label like that. For its auto layout constraints, as is pretty easy enough, we'll say uh, score label dot bottom anchor is a constraint equal to our views uh, safe area layout that so goes above the home indicator dot bottom anchor with a constant of minus twenty. 
bring it a little above that thing, so there's a bit of space between the, that and the home indicator. And score label, oops, score label dot center x anchor is, oh sorry, dot constraint equal to view dot center x anchor, like that. So center it horizontally near the bottom of the screen. Uh, I need a comma there. <clears throat> now, of course, to use that score, we're going to add some code in our touches ended. Here we are, check move. We're going to say if the level's clear, if they've won the level, awesome. We're going to add some score to them. We're going to say score plus equals current level times two. So they get more points based on every level they're on, twice whatever the level they're on. And the reason we have to increment the score in increasing amounts is because of this else block. If they have not won the level, I'm going to do score minus equals one. Take away their score. If they spend a long time making lots of small moves to solve a level, they're going to get negative score very quickly. I'll press Command R again. Eugene, the dogs do come, but they look for treats, they're looking for super chats. So uh, if you want dogs to come, get a treat, super chat. Anyway, score is zero down there in bold 24 with zero cyan. And I drag these things around, you'll see it's score minus one, score minus two. And when I solve a level, it'll go up. So score is now minus one. If I try and do some fewer moves, like that, score is now three. Ooh, that's a messy one. Uh, can you do that in one tap? No. <laughs> uh, uh, how's that? Yeah. So your goal is to try and solve it now in as few moves as possible, which is actually quite hard to do sometimes. There we go. 15. Uh, this one can go up here. Oh no, it can't. Rats. It's a hard game. <laughs> uh, that one, there we go. Boom. Uh, for this one, See, I'm not just playing a game live on YouTube. I'm becoming a Twitch streamer. <laughs> uh, that do it. No, I haven't done it. Rats. It's got to come down here somewhere. There we go. So you can see the game gets harder and harder and harder as you progress. But fortunately, it adds more score. Otherwise, it'd be unfair. Matthew, thank you very much. I'm sure the dogs will come back shortly when I call them. Uh, I've got this big bag of treats here. I mean, do listen very carefully to the bag of treats normally, but just call them now and then. Anyway. That's our game done. And what time are we on? Look at that. Five minutes seven. That's not bad. That is under an hour. Hello, Luna. Come here. You get a treat. Well, do you have one already? No, Aria had a travel treat yet. You've had one already. So I'm sorry. Aria, come here. Aria. Come on. You've earned a treat. Not you. You have one already. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come here. Come on. Good dog. This is from Matthew. All right. That finishes our game. So you can see we have core graphics, we have draggable views, we have a bit of function stuff in there, uh, we have this nice lines crossing stuff going on, and lots of basic infinite levels. It gets infinitely hard at this point because it'll keep on adding more and more points. Hey, there's one treat from now, sweetheart. That finishes our game. If you have any questions about the game or about other things, now is your chance to ask. Uh, Goosewag, there are the constraints again. They're not very terrifically hard. Uh, Rendered lines goes edge to edge and score labels bottom center. You can get some more in a minute. <laughs> yeah, the dogs are never far away, are you? Good dogs. Yes, you are. Any questions I can help you with? Otherwise, I'll get an early night, which is quite nice. As a reminder, this code will be on GitHub shortly, as soon as YouTube finishes with a stream, which takes a while. Um, sadly sometimes. So I normally wait for that stream to be fully live and fully active and then push the code to uh, uh, GitHub and then uh, link out everywhere. Uh, Stephen, the book I recommended is this one here, Essential Mathematics for Games and Internet Applications. This thing is packed with maths. I love it. I, I mean, it is, I use it, use it all the time. You can, you can kind of see it at a glance. I'm not sure you'll see in the camera. There's lots and lots of things like that in there, um, full of explaining to you how things work exactly like that. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, why not var marked week? Yeah, sure. Yeah, week's fine. It's a good idea. It's a good idea. Uh, week bar after. There you go. Good idea. Chris Apps, you can find it on um, the example code knowledge base uh, full of stuff there check it out um like i said if you want it just true or false just modify it you know you go into here you'd say don't return a tuple just return true 
here to stitch it, you know, return true, and then return false, and then return false. And that's obviously faster, because uh, there's less work being done. So if you just don't, in this game, we don't care exactly where the, the line cross happened. We just care that it happened or not happened. Uh, and that's how you do it. And so you save a bit of extra time there. And that probably matters on, I don't know, very bad devices. The oldest iPad that iOS 12 supports with many connection dots. You might find it'll help performance enough to get you over the line. Um, yeah, whatever works. I'll, I'll undo that just quickly. Boom, there we go. Phil Curry, details on Swift on Sundays. Uh, it's fairly simple. All I do is um, uh, make an app, ideally right now, in an hour or so. Sometimes longer, like 75 minutes or 90 minutes, but broadly speaking, as, as fast as we can. Um, and that's it. All we do is stream out how to make a complete app from scratch. I try and teach something new every time. You know, we haven't, we haven't had any overlap here in terms of what we've been covering. Um, so I want everyone to be new. Uh, we've done, you know, AR kit, we've done sprite kit physics, we've done coordinators, we've done all sorts of stuff. Um, so I try and keep each one being new. At some point, I'll get bored and probably start doing technique projects or multi-week projects, like a two or three week project. Um, but right now, it's basically one app, one week. And that seems to work out quite nicely, I think. Uh, how would I refactor this, Andrea asks. So, I mean, you know, this lines cross thing hasn't got to be in there. Where you'd put it, I don't know. Because you can't extend CG point. Um, because it, it's not really a CG point method. And I guess you could do extension CG point line ending with that end point. It collides with start to end to. You could do that little bit clumsy but you could do that and that would get you ooh, quite a few lines out immediately you know uh, 30 lines out immediately um, so you could perhaps start there um, rendering images I wouldn't take that out that's absolutely fine uh, placing this could go out that could you know that that's just placing views you could say you could put that into the connect view directly and say hey connect view place yourself and it would decide where to go inside a remit of a bounds um, that's fine. I can come out. Uh, leveling up. Eh, eh. Yeah, I'll probably leave it there. Not too worried about that. And if you desperately wanted to, you could make the whole thing a UI view subclass. But you're not really saving a grand amount there, to be honest with you. Um, so, place would come out. Lines cross would come out. <sighs> Level clear. Not really. I mean, if if you desperately wanted to, you could take level clear out. And this is if you were desperate. I really wouldn't do it. Um, you could say add an extension on arrays that happen to contain connection views. Are you empty or not? Are you clear or not? Um, but it's not ideal. So there's not a lot of chances here. You could probably get down to about 80 lines of code. So about half the size it is right now. Uh, if you desperately wanted to. But I'm not particularly looking at this and being upset you know ui view subclass would do most of this stuff um and extensions the rest of the way more or less uh goosebag walker wants to know why we have frame width divided by two in connection view um so what's happening here is we are moving our center point so if i just had this if i had just this code here move to uh so I just move, find out what they move to, and move our center to that point. What would happen is that we would move the center of our circle to be where their finger was. And that's fine, that would work, but it would mean that as soon as you moved slightly, it would snap the center of the thing to wherever your finger was. Now, if, if you touch in the middle, that's fine, it would be exactly right. If you touch on the left of the view, you sort of like, if you imagine a big view, you use this big, you tap here, so as you move, it would snap it in like that, so your center was on the finger, which, is, which would look weird, especially making really small moves in more advanced levels. What you want to do is keep that pin there so it pins the left-hand side like that. Now, we're modifying the center of our view. That's what this thing does in line 32. It changes the center of our view, right? That's how the UI kit works. But we started from 
the left edge or the right edge or the top right edge or the bottom left edge, whatever it is, some edge of the, of the thing. So we're storing that away where they started touching the thing. And we're storing it away as an offset from the center because we're going to modify the center. So we want to say, okay, we were 10 points to the left of the center. That's what it's doing here. Remember that we were 10 points left of the center. So all we're doing here, we're saying move to the point that they moved to with a finger minus that 10 points to the left of the center to keep it so it's always stays offset. So they start pressing top left corner, they stay pressing top left corner as they move it around. So it stays much more natural. That's all we're doing there. Um, Christine Stanley, could you use the protocol and delegate instead of the closure? Of course you could, you absolutely could here. Um, and this is one of those places where you may personally decide it's a better place to use a protocol and delegate. Um, for me, my cutoff is three callbacks. Like if I have three or four, five, six, seven, eight, I'll use a protocol and delegate nearly always. If I have two or one, I'll use a closure. Um, that I've seen folks do, you know, even one is a protocol and delegate. I consider that not Swifty, but you know, it doesn't matter. If that makes you happy, do that. Um, it's down to you. It's, uh, we all have our own cutoff points, right? That's fine. Uh, Mustafa Khalil, why not make the connection view unwrap optional instead of force unwrapping it? There is no force unwrapping here, Mustafa. This is not a force unwrap. This is an implicitly unwrapped optional. Uh, I don't tend to do force unwrap unless it's really required. Um, you'll know why immediately. If I press question mark here, you'll see some comedy build errors straight away saying, we're trying to do lines cross after it needs to be optional. Therefore, we've got to unwrap that first. Now, we know our connections always have after value set. That's the point of these things. They always have value set. There's never a point when there is none after. If there is, it's a coding mistake. It should never ever happen. Uh, so we're now gonna add extra work for guard let check they have an after value when they always have after values. And that is the point of implicitly on our optionals. That's not a force wrap, it's an IOU, IUO, sorry. Uh, it's always there. So it's a much better idea to use an exclamation mark rather than a question mark for that one. Phil Curry, same time every Sunday. Yes, as much as I can. Uh, I should say Dub Dub DC approaches very quickly, so I will stop for that period and for a period afterwards. Let me check my phone. Uh, so it is the nineteenth today. Uh, I'll be doing another one next week, the twenty sixth, and then I'll be in San Jose. So the next next week is the last one for a while, um, but the previous load have nearly always been at the same time. So go on YouTube. Check my playlist and you'll see another 16 before this one, each building full apps from scratch or games from scratch, showing all sorts of things. We've done you know, cool things with ARKit, for example, or CoreML. Go check those out and, and you'll see them there. Um, Bob Goodwin asks, why not use or consider using UI collision and UI collision behavior? You know, I guess you could try, it's, it's overkill. I mean, it's not terribly hard to do this kind of thing. Um, so you can probably do that other way if you want to do. Uh, SV Swift or React Native? Of course, uh, for me, Swift every time. I spend, you know, when I've done React Native, it's fine, but I spend too much time reinventing what a table view is, you know? Installing my own font so I can add a disclosure indicator that looks like system one. Adding one point line under my rows that is free of charge table, table views. So I'm not really a React Native kind of person. Also, Swift's very cool. I love Swift. SV, it does not open opportunities for more jobs at all. It really does not. You know, you look at the number of companies using Swift, there's thousands, tens of thousands, probably more. No companies using React Native, hardly any, <laughs> right? Yes, in theory, you can do code now on Android, but in practice, you've got a whole other world of pain and a much, much smaller market for jobs. So no, it does not open up more jobs at whatsoever. Um, reflecting me, am I right in thinking we differentiated between already sold at the start and a sold by player. Uh, yeah, we did. So what we do there is uh, in our view control and we call level up, we have this thing we say, while level is clear, keep moving the connections around until level's not clear, which point is at least one cross and we're happy. Ah, Ryan, thank you very much. When the dogs return, they will, uh, I think they're outside barking right now, but in theory, 
they'll hear that in theory, and uh, I'll give one of them a treat when they get back. Thank you very much. Blah, 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 blah. If you're paging through a collection view, and you want to do something when a page changes, would you do it in scroll view, then scroll animation? Um, you could do, but you can also use scroll view to scroll um, to do that. If you really wanted to, you know, check things well, that way, um, particularly because you might want to do it before the deceleration finishes. Um, like do it immediately, like update a paging dot for something, for example. Um, I'll probably do it earlier than that. Uh, Francesco, I have no idea what the next Swift on Sunday will be about. I make them up as I go along. I have no grand plan. I'm just having fun, basically. Obviously, live streaming my fun on YouTube, but I'm just noodling around in Swift live uh, and kind of enjoying it. So I have genuinely no idea what's coming next. Uh, come in, tune in next week, and you'll find out. I, mean, I normally announce on like Thursday or Wednesday sometime. Um, so if I have a good idea, I'll let you know on Twitter. Uh, David Lindsay, it seems Apple getting too far away from NBC through wanting to stimulate code means you get some of the free nav goodies. Um, I'm not sure I'd agree with that. You know, if you look at, if you just Google up um, NBC, um, you get this picture here. This is on Wikipedia itself. You see Wikipedia here. Uh, and in this view, the model updates the view, the view sees the user, uses the controller, controller manipulates the model. Uh, and that is not in any way how Apple does NBC. It just isn't, right? Uh, that's the, the, the Apple, we tend to put all our code in the controller, we manipulate the model for the controller, we update the view for the controller. It's basically a massive view controllers. Uh, that's what we do. Uh, and canonical MVC has a model update the view directly. So I wouldn't worry about your code not matching Apple's MVC because Apple MVC is not really canonical MVC either. I wouldn't really wouldn't worry too much about the weird way Apple does MVC. Um, however, I would recommend that you do refactor your code and don't take Apple's example code as being particularly great. You know, they I've shown you before, I'll show you again just quickly. Some of their code is just shocking, shocking code. If you make a new iOS app and choose master detail app and have core data and say, I call this thing ABC, and then uh, on desktop here, you'll see it just makes pretty nasty code. Um, so you see in our app delegate, we have all this junk in here, you know, there's a force unwrap here, a force typecast here, um, but do you have another force typecast here, another one force uh, unwrap here, uh, force typecast again and again, and then there's more code down here for doing um, split view control delegate, delegates in your app delegate, obviously. There's some core data code in here, it's really messy. And then our master view controller, uh, you'll see there is a, another force typecast, uh, force typecast there. There is a, a force typecast and another force typecast in a single line of code. <laughs> um, it's just, like, don't anyway consider Apple's code is particularly excellent because, you know, they're, they're winging it too, I think, half the time. And there's more creator code scattered through here. It's just shocking, shocking code. Uh, anyway. Nico, thank you very much. Hopefully the dogs come up and get these treats soon. I have them downstairs again, so. That's one each for them, so I'll see if they come up shortly. Uh, Robert Dorantis, could you choose a closure or two and indicate where that closure is called? I struggle with the closure declaration and its call site. Okay, so I have closures here. You mean in, in, in this code, I'm guessing, Robert? Because I have them uh, up here as properties for our connection view, drag changed and drag finished. And they're both optional. Uh, and I call drag changed down here from touches moved. Uh, I say as soon as it's moved, call drag changed immediately. It's optional, so we put a question mark before it here. And the same for drag finished. As soon as touches end is called, call that closure. And that will pipe back to, in our case, it'll pipe back to our view controller. We have uh, we set drag changed and drag finished to be these two closures. Uh, the first one being call redraw lines, second one being draw finished. So it allows our connection views to talk back to our view controller in a really clean, abstracted way because you know we don't want to have our view knowing about the view controller. We just don't. In theory, we could have many kinds of view controllers powering these kinds of connection views. We don't want to tie them to their view controller. We want to say, hey, something's happened. You figure it out. That's what we want to do, really. So um, it's it's nice. 
can I show the game again? Yeah, sure, if you want me to. I can sit and play it all you like to, really. Uh, it's, on, it's on quite a high level, mind you, so it'll be quite hard to play. I'll run it again. Let me tell I'll try and call my dogs again. Let's see if they hear that. Right, so here we are, level one. So there's only five dots. Uh, I'm going to drag this thing here to here and get them all green and level up. And here, I'm going to move that one. Yeah. So the goal is to try and uh, get the code down as low as uh, the moves down as low as possible. Make the fewest moves to uh, win each level like that. It's getting harder now, so I'll move this one to. Oh no, it's a hard one. Oh no, there, there we go. Okay, not bad. Um, disequilibrio. Um, do you recommend RX Swift? Yes, if you like RX, use RX Swift. I don't use it personally, but if you, if you like that sort of thing, then that's the sort of thing you'll like. <laughs> uh, how to stop stutter in table view when reloading at multiple sections and rows. So if your reloading takes that long, I mean, that's going to be at least sort of eight milliseconds of time, uh, then you want to look at where that time's going. You know, use Time Profiler, see where it's going. Um, and if it's just literally loading your data, which seems unlikely, if it is, then you're kind of stuck. You look at things like reloading only some cells, not all cells, uh, might help. But you might find you're doing a lot of work in there, Time Profiler, and see at a glance, oh, that's quite slow. Uh, and in fact, if you look at Project 30, the video from Hacking with Swift, which is online right now, you'll see we have a slow table view. You can see it scrolling slowly. Try that instead. Uh, also, make sure you have prefetching enabled. That also helps a lot for slow table view cells and collection view cells. Pippin's hoping for live reloading on the simulator. That'd be nice. Um, that'd be lovely. We'll see. You know, because of the marzipan switch, a big thing for me this time will be the fact that, in theory, I can run unit tests in Mac OS for an iOS app, as opposed to having to launch a simulator every sort of unit test I'm running. So that'd be really nice. It's like instant unit tests would be so nice. Andre, I'm glad you love the app. Unwrap, please leave a nice review. And like this video. It's helpful. It does help a lot. Uh, why does Apple make bad templates? <laughs> um, I think two reasons. Uh, if, if you go to Google again and do um, Xcode template coordinators. I'll probably find me, I expect. There you go. This is how to create a custom Excel template for coordinators. And it's an example template using coordinators. Um, and the coordinated parts are relevant. What you're seeing here is how it actually works. And it basically uses P lists, property lists, for doing their code. And it is really nasty. And um, of course, they have to think about Objective C or Swift or using core data or not using core data or whatever. There are lots of options. And so they use inheritance. They have a basic type, then they have a core data type that builds on that, a master data type that builds on that, and so forth. And they use property lists to in structure those in a nice way. I think they've made it so flexible, they've made it very hard to write good code. That's one reason. Um, that doesn't excuse the bad code. The second reason, I mean, the, the real serious reason, I think, is because they mostly still think in Objective-C. Like Apple's software today is still vastly written in Objective-C, nearly entirely Objective-C, not Swift. And even their keynote presentations they do, they do in Objective-C, you know, for WWC. And someone else you know, on the Swift documenting team will port that code to Swift um, to go on the slides. So the, the presentation team, the actual team who want to show off stuff and, you know, core data or everything announced this year will write a bit of C code nearly always and someone else will port that to Swift for them to make it make it good Swift. Um, so um, that's a ma major reason I suspect that they're not writing much in terms of actual Swift day to day. And that will change hopefully. As uh, now Swift 5 standard and Swift 5 one's hopefully coming in about 10 days or so. It's in beta form. Um, it'll get better I think. But but uh um, Hazem, do I have any advice for dealing with spaghetti code? Uh, I have stacks of articles about um, hacking with Swift 
refactor and you'll find they are how to refactor massive view controllers um, and there's lots of advice here using a real world project giving you various ideas how to refactor stuff um, go and check that out um, and there's actually a little series I did previously um, here how to you know refactor to add unit tests cocoa pods swiftlint fastlane github and more to get it really up to date um, so between those two you'll hopefully find some tips to get you started How about hosting these templates in GitHub? So you've been hosting Apple's templates. Uh, they would not like that, I suspect. Um, they're a bit funny, Apple. Even though the code is appalling, they probably wouldn't like that. And at some point, they'll change those templates to be better. I just hope it doesn't break all my projects because that would be very annoying. <laughs> we'll see. Uh, ACH asks, what am I doing with my time right now? Is it challenging? Uh, I've just put out an update for Unwrap 1.1. It's in a review right now. It'll be out probably uh, Monday. Um, right now, the main thing I'm doing is updating my books to Swift 5 because that's been sitting there on my to-do list for a long time and playing Yoshi's Crafted World on the Switch with my eldest daughter. And my youngest one, too, she likes it as well. That's my main thing because right in, in, in 10 days, I'm flying out to San Jose um, and my workload goes through the roof for Dub Dub and alt conf and other things like that so i want to enjoy my downtime now while i still can because i'll get much busier uh, between now and then i really do need to switch servers um, because the server that hacking stuff runs on is i don't know three years old now four years old perhaps and it's old and it has to get updated to a new server which means moving everything across getting everything across safely change the configuration getting new certificates and stuff really really not exciting stuff um, but it will mean I'll be able to upgrade to latest versions of all my software so I'll be able to add some important new features that folks have been asking for not least site-wide search will finally come I'm looking forward to that so that will happen hopefully in the next week or so as soon as the books are done because they're a higher priority uh, is using realm a better choice than what I mean you know, everything has pros and cons. You know, CloudKit works really nicely. So does Core Data. But if you don't like it, fine. Use uh, Realm. Use something else. I don't really care what you do. Um, there's always a, a of options out there. There is no absolute one best for all situations. David says, in terms of free nav goodies, I was referring to the auto disappearing and disappearing of the tab bar. Um, yeah, so that's not that's not automatic, David. Um, I don't, you've got to ask for that. You know, if you look at the source code to unwrap um, workspace, there we go. Um, this thing unwrap here uh, has tabs at the bottom. If I play this back in the 10R simulator. Uh, and you'll see this thing has tabs uh, and navigation controllers and they don't hide. The tab bar stays visible uh, and I find that really annoying. <laughs> I really, really want the tab bar to go. Uh, so you'll see here, come on, you can do it. Yes, go away, I know, I'm about to think. Right, learn, variables, boom, that slides in. I want this thing to go away. Uh, and it doesn't go away, it's staying visible. Now what you want to do, I, I don't have it right now, you want to say, uh, hides bottom bar, uh, bottom bar when, oh come on, I can't type, bottom bottom bar when pushed. And that's not in my code, there it is, it's just there. Boom. So you can see, in our learn coordinator, make a new study view controller, and show it. With hide bottom bar pushed is true. And that causes the tab bar to be hidden. But you can see it's not being hidden. It's not being hidden. Even though I'm specifically saying, please hide the bottom bar. And the reason for that is because, as part of my iPad upgrades for Unwrap, we moved across to Adaptive Layout, which uses a split view controller. It's invisible in iPhone, but it's there for iPad automatically. Uh, and cunningly, hides bottom bar when pushed gets ignored with split view controllers, which is deeply annoying. Um, so even though on iPhone SE, you know, the smallest iPhone you can test on, 
you really want that screen base, you disgrace, you really want that bottom bar to be pushed and hidden away, it won't be. It'll stay there no matter what, thanks to the split view controller. This call here, show the top view controller from the split view controller, is doing that push. Um, but it's doing it adaptively, thanks to Apple's clever code, which is not clever enough to realize that high to bottom bar push is set, and so the tab bar is not hidden, which is a real, real shame. Anyway. Cypher Poet. What are some good approaches to testing a project like this that makes heavy use of custom view rendering logic? Um, so, I mean, you know, the problem is that there's randomness. So the amount of testing you can do becomes limited if you re retain the randomness. Um, what you really want to do is write tests where you can first. So you probably say something first, you know, um, when I've called level up and level one, then uh, connection should have exactly five items. When I have called level up, uh, there should be level clear should be true. So you know that level clear is working correctly and the placing is working correctly and so forth. Um, so there are places you can test, but you wouldn't want to do uh, rendering testing. You wouldn't want to say, oh yes, is the layout what I expected? Uh, that'd be problematic, I expect. So yeah, don't do that. But there are some places you can do. I expect. Yeah. Oh, Rob, that'd be awesome. Please do come. It's going to be a really fun event. I'm looking forward to it a lot. It is coming together slowly. Uh, I am not really enjoying conference organizing, <laughs> um, but it's working out well. And the nice thing is we're already uh, very profitable. So we know we, you know, all, all the money is going to charity, all the profits going to charity. So we already know we have a sizable donation to a charity. Even if we sell normal tickets, we already have a sizable donation. Um, and I'm very grateful to, we've had six speakers so far agreed to come. Daniel Steinberg, John Sundell, Sally Shapiro, uh, Ellen Shapiro, Sally Shepard, and, and more, including for the first time in the UK, um, someone from Apple, which is so nice of them. I'm really grateful to them for sending someone for the first time to a UK Swift event, which is great. And Kilo Loco is coming. Kyle, Kyle Lee is coming from LA. He's never left the US. He went briefly to the northern part of Mexico, which is near his house. <laughs> he said it doesn't really count. He considers it um, not, not really uh, different, but... He's coming to the UK for the first time, well, leaving North America for the first time, <laughs> to come to the UK. Which would be cool. Looking forward to it. Okay. It is now 25 minutes past seven. If you have more questions, uh, go ahead and ask now. Otherwise, grab me online. I am Two Straws on Twitter. If you must, you can email me. I am paul at hackingwithswift.com. Uh, if you're asking me random coding questions, you will not get a response. How do I do X, Y, Z? I just don't respond to those. Um, I, get, I got one this week, which was um, someone asking me to solve the interview question for them. Not going to happen. Uh, the cheekiest I've ever had was last month. I had someone say they want that the, their startup is trying to solve a complicated problem. And if they can just do this last one thing, they'll finally get funding. Can I solve it for them free of charge? <laughs> no. No. Get out of town. Oh, well. Uh, but otherwise, I'm uh, on email. And of course, there's a, there's a Slack group too. If you like Slack, we have a Hacking with Swift Slack workspace. I can paste the uh, URL for that into the chat window. There are channels there for uh, all sorts of things, like the 100 Days of Swift Challenge, for example. Go and check that out. Boom, there's the uh, Slack URL. You can ask there, email, Twitter, even Reddit if you must, I'm on there too. Can I paste the link for the power pack? Yes, I can, but I wouldn't recommend buying it just yet because uh, WWDC is around the corner. And uh, traditionally, I have run a 50% off sale during that period, so you can get the power pack for half price. Um, and if I were, in theory, to run the same sale in, I don't know, ooh, about 10 days time, uh, then you would find out uh, in about 10 days and you could buy it at half price. So perhaps wait, unless you feel lucky. Any more questions or am I done? I can go and play some more Yoshi's Crafted World. It's a lovely game, lovely, lovely game. Yo, I'm glad you liked it. Please do like the video, subscribe and all that kind of thing. Ahmed, ask the Realm team, they'll tell you. 
That's a bit, bit uh, precise for this podcast, for this uh, video stream. You are most welcome, Robert. I'm glad you all enjoyed it. And I still have some treats for the dogs. I've got three more treats to give the dogs. They're still downstairs barking at something. You know, one dog barked a lot. Two dogs bark more than twice as much. Because one dog starts the other dog barking, which is a real joy. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we've got two barkers. I suspect Sammy Eds are a barking breed, uh, retrospectively. Oh, well. They're good with kids. They're very, very good with kids. And... All being well, they will be at Hacking with Swift Live. So if you want to meet my dogs in, in, in person, that is your chance. And by the way, if you come to the uh, uh, live podcast stream at AltConf, I, there will be stickers. Um, so if you want to grab me uh, there, you can get a Hacking with Swift sticker and a uh, Swift over coffee sticker there. Uh, they are free of charge. Just come and grab me and say hello. Andrea, I think the key is to be selective. You know, I try and make something for everyone. Um, you know, here we've done, uh, what have we done? We've done obviously core cool graphic stuff. We've done subclassing of stuff. We've done uh, a bit of, you know, point free functional stuff. Um, there's, there's a variety of things, uh, you know, closures and stuff. So I try and do a bit of something for everyone, really. I can't do everything for everyone, clearly, but something for everyone is, is, is there. Um, so, Pick and choose what excites you. That's what I'm doing. You know, I, I make things that interest me right now. Uh, otherwise, trust me, these streams would not be anywhere near as much fun. I'd be bored out of my skull doing things. I try and, you know, be excited about what I'm doing. You know, I love coding and I love talking about coding and listening about coding. So, uh, lots of that. How do you find memory leaks and fix leaks? Um, you want to use uh, instruments for that. And just recently I've posted... Uh, project 30 to the site which does exactly that if you go to uh, slash read on here then scroll down to project 30 and choose instruments you will see in here uh, waste allocation slow shadows and running out of memory this one here particularly uh, these two particularly will tell you the memory check that out Hector thank you so much you know I have no marketing at all other than people sharing my content. This is why I ask folks to like the video and subscribe to the video and so forth. Um, you know, someone recommending my books is the only marketing I have. So please recommend them. If you enjoyed a book, enjoyed a project, whatever it is, tell the world, tell the world, and, and, and it does help me a great deal. That's all I have marketing-wise. So uh, please do that. <laughs> closures is everyone. Maybe, maybe. I know some folks find closures baffling, but there you go. Samson, I'm glad you like Realm. That's fine. That's awesome. Not everyone does. And that's cool. Uh, is there a code for Swift to control a backlight of a MacBook? You know, I don't know. I don't know. I've never tried it before. Right, folks. It's half past seven. It's your last chance to ask questions. Otherwise, I am going offline to... Uh, relax <laughs> and play some games for a while maybe do some more bug updating although it is Sunday night a bit of a break you know uh, I, I get folks telling me all the time I have just discovered you just now found you uh, uh, so even with my best attempts at getting the word out there clearly I'm failing um, so I need to do better. Yeah. It certainly helped that um, if you go to Swift.org uh, on their blog, then when they announced Swift 5, Apple very kindly linked to a playground I made of the new feature in Swift 5. Um, and that kind of thing just helps spread the word a bit more. Um, but broadly speaking, it's just people recommending my stuff. So please recommend my books. Uh, Pavlos, I finished the wine. Sorry, <laughs> I, was, I was pretty sharp on that wine. I drank it all down. It was very nice. <coughs> gone uh burkant it will be if you go to uh github 
uh, GitHub, come on, GitHub, two straws, uh, and then Swift on Sundays. Um, they're all here. So you'll see just type was last week's project. Uh, that was a iCloud powered syntax highlighting text editor in 55 minutes or so. So that was last week. And then watch action was, was watch OS. Spot sign was AR kit. Text control was Mac OS. Multi mark was multi screen markdown editing. That was a game. There's all sorts in there. Um, so um, yeah, it'll be on there shortly, but I try and edit the YouTube video first. So it'll probably be tomorrow morning for that's actually up there and linked to. Uh, Robert, I expect the books any day now. Uh, I'm trying to go through them as fast as I can. The changes are so small and so light, but there's just so much of the books these days. There's many, many books. I think 16 or so books these days. It's been a long time to get through them all. Um, so hopefully it'll be any day now. Um, so yes, way before September is the answer. Uh, Pavlos, I nearly always drink Malbec. And it's not Malbec, it's a Merlot. Mostly Malbec. Swift with wine on Sundays. Should we rebrand my little thing, perhaps? What game am I going to play? Uh, Yoshi's Crafted World on the Switch. It's a beautiful, happy, carefree, innocent game. I love it very much. I'm playing that right now with... Both of my daughters now play that game. They both love it. Stephen, what would I change about my app right now? Which app? The, the, the app I've just made? Or Unwrap? Or something else? Can we fit a small minimized player by increasing the height and fitting the tab bar? I don't know what you mean, but it sounds like child view controllers are a good thing for that. Uh, they're always a good thing. Do you recommend Pikatsu? Never heard of Pikatsu. Sorry. Ah, what would I change about Unwrap? That's a, that's a good question. Um, if you look at the source code again in here, you will see there are a couple of fix me's. Not many. Um, and uh, this one is a mistake. I shouldn't even be there. Cool. <laughs> I should not even be there. I should, be, that's what I say, I should just come out. Um, the rest of them, though, are there intentionally because these are things that are weird and they're behaving weird. I've got these long comments explaining what I tried, why I end up with this solution, and why it feels wrong. Uh, same for web views, same for this user down here. These are things that are fundamentally wrong with the system. In this case, you can see there's a big warning here telling me the variable's never changed. Make it let, okay, let's make it let. Guard let condition, fine. Get rid of the warning. And now when I build the code, we get an error instead. You can't use this, it's a constant. You use let. Back to being var again. Error goes away, the warning comes back. Um, that's a Swift problem. Uh, and the same is true here and, and here and here. These are UI kit problems that are plaguing me. Uh, I do really don't want them to. Um, so I've put the fixes in there, so when I go to WBC in 10 days time or two weeks time, whatever it is, I will grab someone at the lab and say, hey, look at this code. How do I make it better? Um, so that's the immediate thing as those fix me's in the code. Um, what else would I change? You know, I, I, I had a go at refactoring some of the storyboard. The storyboard isn't ideal, realistically, in here. If I did look for storyboard, um, because there's a lot of duplication here. Um, and it has questions, basically. It's duplicated. So you'll see, uh, come on, you can load it. You see, uh, there is this layout for practice stuff where there's a gray bar at the top a content area and then a button at the bottom or two buttons. Gray bar, content, gray bar, content, button, gray bar, content, buttons, and so forth. There's lots of these things. And in theory, that could be refracted into uh, child view controllers. I did try that and wasted a good four hours. I ended up with a lot more code and it didn't feel good at all. Um, so I kind of backed out of that and left it as it is for now. Um, so I think the storyboard deserves another look to make that refactor more nicely into code. Um, I don't like the welcome, uh, sorry, the home, home data source here. This is a lot of code. This is like 235 lines of code. Uh, and it's pretty nasty. Look, you can see there's like 
case zero, case one here, case zero, one, two. There's a lot of code in here that really ought to be refactored into something much, much cleaner. Um, so I think that I'd look at if I had more time. But it's not a deal breaker. It's a pretty average kind of problem to hit with UI kit. So uh, I'm not totally worried about that. Ah, do I recommend the Pokemon movie? Uh, if you mean Detective Pikachu, uh, yes, I enjoyed it very much, and so did my nine year old. It was very funny. Is there a way to use SVG render from WebKit to render in a UI view? Well, you can render web views. You can render it to a, a WK web view and then put that into an image view if you really want to. Um, and that would work fine. Uh, Robert, link it to the site. That's fine. Please do that. All I ask is that you use vaguely meaningful keywords because some folks will do a link with the word here or this, which Google just doesn't understand. If you put in, you know, free Twitter tutorials or great Twitter tutorials, whatever you like this thing, I hate these Twitter tutorials if you really want to, um, then Google can read that and go, oh, there's some Swift tutorials here and, and index that for Swift tutorials. That's how Google works. So all I ask is you use some decent keywords. Uh, well, I'll, I'll be in California shortly. I expect I'll drink my fair share of Californian wine while I'm there. Thank you for that, Robert. Do I have a Synology NAS? No, I don't. I use um, Backblaze for my backup. And I also have B2 for doing long-term backup of stuff as well, which is quite nice. Okay. This is it. Last, 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 last chance now to ask questions. I sign off and have dinner, I expect. <laughs> uh, yeah. You found something on Swift News. Swift News is very good. I recommend Sean Allen's stuff very much. He's on YouTube as well. Uh, I think it's youtube.com slash Sean Allen, like from memory. Um, YouTube slash Sean Allen. Yeah, there he is. Go check him out. He's very good. Um, he does Swift News and more. Okay. That's a lot, folks. If you have more, tweet me. Join the Slack if you must. Email me. Although I expect a good two or three wait, wait, wait on the emails. Uh, if not more, tweeting or Slack is usually better. Uh, I'll push the code to GitHub once it's finished with YouTube's processing time and all that kind of jazz. But it'll be 